you know, we fought for disability rights. And then it was like, what next? How can we be in the community more? And how can we bring the rest of the community in with us? Welcome to Impact the Conversation, a podcast of the University of Minnesota's Institute on Community Integration that brings you strategies and stories advancing the inclusion of people with disabilities. Our guests are the authors of Impact, our long-running magazine that bridges the research to practice gap with professional and personal reflections on what matters most in disability equity today. I'm your host, Janet Stewart. My guest today is Nikki Villavicencio. Nikki, it's great to have you here today in the studio. Thanks for having me. Can you tell our our listeners a little bit about who you are and the organization that you work for? Sure. I'm a disability rights activist turned disability culture and leadership specialist at Advocating Change Together. And we are a grassroots nonprofit organization that is led by people with disabilities to um, train and teach and work side by side with people with disabilities to um, further their self-determination and self-advocacy skills. That's great. And it's been around our community for a long time and has a, a long history here. What's the organization up to these days? So we have disability equality trainings. In fact, I teach a few of the classes. We have disability uh, power days on Thursdays, which is a fun open class to anybody in the public that can come. And um, we do it once a month. We do in person. And then the other Thursdays, we do it virtually. We have a um, Monday coffee chat Uh, We have a side-by-side choir where people with and without disabilities come together and sing um, disability rights songs together and have a great time. Uh, Let's see, what else do we do? We do conferences. We have have an Olmstead Academy where we teach folks about their rights around the Olmstead decision. And then with other hats on, you also are an elected official in our community, and uh, you have a lot of experience in the labor movement. So can you tell me about those other roles? Sure. Yeah. So my my uh, community leadership role has really brought me to advocating change together. Um, and what I didn't mention before about ACT is we have Self-Advocates of Minnesota, which is really our organizing arm of our organization. And there are self-advocacy groups all over the state that do self-advocacy trainings. And so how I kind of got to ACT is um, uh, being really instrumental in the SEIU Home Care Union. I was on the first bargaining contract and I sit on their training committee uh, that helps um, develop the training for home care workers. Uh, And you know, I realized but early on that if I want my care to be better, then I have to really um, help the whole system. And it means sometimes speaking up for my workers who also have um, needs that, that, that are not being met. And then, you know, doing that work also led me to realize that, hey, if you want to see the laws in action that you want to see done, you, you might as well try and, and and be a policymaker as well. And I really believe in representation. And quite frankly, there are not enough people with disabilities being elected in those type of positions. And local politics is a really great place because most people don't understand that housing and um, transportation and really the essential aspects of living in a community are decided by local politicians. And so, you know, I ran my first race in 2018 and lost by five votes, then ran again in 2020 and won by nearly almost 8,000. I was the highest top vote getter in that election. And now I'm running again in 2024. So we'll see where we go. And, and what is your current seat? Where, where do you serve? Maplewood City Council. 
And so with all of that experience, the, the, well, the depth and breadth of that experience made you really the, the person we wanted to reach out to, to be one of our issue editors, when Impact decided to do an issue on disability rights and disability justice. And it's just been terrific working with you on that issue. We met about stories. We met about what types of things we wanted to get covered. We met about what kind, you know, who we wanted to do some of of these articles. And you just have been a terrific guide to me and the rest of the staff to ask those tough questions about, you know, where where do where does disability rights stand today? Where does it maybe divert and disability justice pick up? Um, and so, you know, we've, we've talked about this a little, but tell me, tell me a little more about kind of the intersection of those two movements for you. Yeah. So I look at it as, um, you know, when I was a kid, the Americans with Disabilities Act was signed into law and I didn't even know it happened. And I had to become an adult to understand um, the breadth of what the Americans with Disabilities Act does. And so disability rights will always be something um, that's important to me. It will always be something that's passionate to me. And I look at disability justice as an intersectional movement that really asks the question of the whole community, how can we all work better together? And, um, you know, I am a student of um, sins invalid, which really brings the 10 principles of disability justice. And, um, you know, it's really what ties in all the work that I do in my city council race. My values that I, I, I ran on were about justice and about centering the most marginalized people. And, you know, disability rights um, originally tended to be more centered around male whiteness. And I think disability justice gives the opportunity to hear all the voices at the table that need to be at the table. And just reminding ourselves that centering the most marginalized really gets us to the best solutions. And you, in your article for Impact, you talked about growing up in Crip Camp and some of those stories. Can you tell us just a little bit about what that was like and, and your personal experience with disability? Sure. Yeah. So when Crip Camp came out, if anybody has you know seen it, it's an amazing documentary produced by Barack and Michelle Obama. And it talks about uh, a number of people with disabilities that went to camp together. And I happened to go to a camp very similar to that in the Wisconsin Dells. And uh, so what year would this have been? So I was eight years old. That was in 90. I'm not good at math. 90s, Mid 90s, early 90s. Early 90s. And um, I um, I had a very similar experience to the movie in the sense that it was this awakening for me. And I think this is why I'm so passionate about disability justice is that people with disability disabilities can do things together. So there were times at camp that we learned how to help each other get in each other's in a in our wheelchair, how to help each other eat, how to help each other go to the bathroom. Um, and not because there was a lack, but because we wanted to, because it was like this amazing experiment to be able to say, hey, we don't have to depend on other people that aren't like us. We can actually depend on each other. And that's really cool. And so I carried that in my heart throughout my life. And that and then when I learned about disability justice, it was like it felt like home. It felt like it felt like camp all over again. Did you first learn about it through Sins Invalid? Or? Yes. OK. Several years ago, um, there happened to be a couple of the authors that came to the Twin Cities and they held workshops. And so when, I, when you first heard that and 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 this is an organization organization in California that does a lot with, well, really coined the phrase disability justice and, and came up with the 10 principles surrounding it. But they do a lot, they, the, they do a lot of expression of justice through art. And uh, so that's sort of their modem to, to kind of deliver all of this. Uh, you know, in your own personal intersections, you know, your own ethnicity, 
as you think about that, um, had it had it always occurred to you that maybe the disability experience is different for someone who is white and affluent versus someone from a marginalized community, historically marginalized community? And, and what was that like for you as a realization? Absolutely. You know, that I feel like disability justice really does highlight um, intersectionality the most because there are disabled people in every other community. And, you know, it's exactly what you said. A white woman with a disability, even the same disability as myself, is going to have a different experience than someone of a, a person of color. And so in my own experience, my grandfather immigrated here from the Philippines. And so I'm a quarter Filipino. But he was a huge influence in my life. One of the reasons why is because he delivered me. And he was a doc- He was a prominent doctor in the community I grew up in. And I spent a lot of time with him. And I learned um, just his perseverance through being accepted into an all-white community. And uh, and still, um, you know, living on his legacy from his family. And learning from that really shaped my disability experience because it allows me to relate to people in a different way. It allows me to see different lenses that other people don't always have, which in politics has, you know, afforded me a lot of grace. Because when you have empathy for people, they're much more open to talk with you, to share with you, and to trust you. And even within the disability community, there sadly has been a hierarchy, hasn't there? You know, the people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, for example, have sometimes just not been heard in the broader disability rights movement. And that's a fact. And and you, you have worked with people of all kinds of disabilities through your advocacy work, now working with Advocating Change Together, the Olmstead work that you've done. You've really worked with a lot of people with intellectual disabilities. Have you seen some of that? Have you seen that that maybe people with IDD need to have more of a voice in the disability rights movement? Oh, absolutely. 100 percent. You know, to me, one of the most important parts of disability justice is centering the most marginalized. And people with developmental disabilities have been pushed away for far too long, and their voices do need to be heard. I, I know, um, you know, ICI works a lot with cow tipping and Interact and other organizations similar to that that are, are just kind of starting to or final finally getting some recognition and in, in the in the talent, the beauty, the. Um, just the amount of uh, gifts that th- that people, all people with disabilities, but especially people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, give to our communities. And do you think we're starting to see some change then? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think you know, in my heart, I'm always an activist. So there's a part of me that is always skeptical, but I'm also very hopeful in the sense that um, disability justice gives me the hope that that we're now at a level where I think that we want to be arm in arm with each other. It's not we don't want we don't want to have separate programs, separate um, places to be. We want to be fully integrated. And and I think it's exciting to think about where that could take us. Anything we haven't touched on um, that you think that really just stood out to you as we were going through this experience of putting this together? You had a great conversation with people from all sides of the provider community and the um, advocacy community in an article about how labor unions contribute to this conversation. How was that for you? It was a great experience in the sense that the union movement isn't historically um, connected to the disability community um, traditionally, but goes hand in hand so well. And so a lot of the skills I learned in organizing in the labor movement, I I now use in the disability movement. And 
And it's, you know, when we talk about expressing ourselves in more artistic ways, I think it's it's great to um, blend those two things. But if I could just for a second go back a little bit to what you were talking about with uh, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities being in the disability justice movement, I think the um, thing to that really needs to be kind of maybe opened up and like said, like let's say the word is paternalism. Right. Like I think what held folks with IDD back from the disability justice movement was paternalism. You know, paternalism is a, a challenging um, thing to overcome for a lot of folks with disabilities because being safe is a very important and real thing. But there are many cases in a lot of people with disabilities' lives where safety um, becomes more important than the ability to take risks and the ability to live a life like non-disabled people. And I think that we're getting to a point, you know, we have priorities up at the Capitol to try to adjust guardianship and give more rights to people with disabilities And, you know, I think we need to address housing issues and certainly care issues and putting in putting the decision making back in the hands of people with disabilities is really important. And do you think there's a secondary thread there that that comes out in the issue about allyship along with that? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, going back to my experiences at summer camp, when we were learning how to depend on each other to do things. You know, there is no reason why in in this world we live in now that people with disabilities can't depend on each other in that way. You know, I'm a person with uh, multiple disabilities, but I certainly could help one of my friends with intellectual disabilities maybe balance their budget, maybe help them um, make a grocery list, maybe, you know, do many different things. And we can depend in, on each other to do those things. And there's many, there's semi-independent living. There's lots of different ways people can live with support. It reminds me of the very end of your article when you, when you told a, just a great image of a, of a story about rowing together at, at camp. Can you, can you tell that, share that story? Sure, yeah. So one of my friends um, that I met every year at camp, one of the first years uh, we were together, uh, we got to row a canoe together. And it was the most um, exciting, scary, fascinating thing I probably have ever done. And we both, um, so she is a person that was born without arms, and I am a person that uses my feet. I have very limited m- movement in my arms and hands. And so both of us rowed success rode successfully a boat together. She did one side and I did the other side. And um, it was just another example of two people with disabilities doing something that probably many other people thought could never happen. Love it. I would like to add one more thing, if that's okay. Sure. So, you know, one thing that I'm very um, passionate about is the rights of parents with disabilities. So I've worked on legislation around parenting with a disability. There is a report that's coming out, like literally this week or next, about uh, parenting with a disability in Minnesota. And it's the report will be going to the legislature and we're trying to build up supports and the rights of parents with disabilities because right now uh, you're two to three times more likely in the state of Minnesota to have your parental rights terminated if you have a disability on your educational record. Wow. And so what is that conversation right now? Because there, we're talking as a nation right now about guardianship again, you know, with all of the high profile cases that have been out there, this is a multifaceted issue. So how do we craft something that ensures parents with disabilities have parental rights, but also ensures that the children, the people with disabilities have rights as well? Yeah, so there's a national report called Rocking the Cradle. I think it was um, put out by the National Council on Disability. And it, it goes through the whole problem. And then it actually gives many different solutions 
to help the, the issue. And one of them that I've been working on is more of a preventative. It's to give care specifically for pre- parenting. So not a babysitter. But like, for instance, I'm a mother. I have an 11 year old. Um, But when my 11 year old was six months, I was denied more care because my care was not for my daughter. And then um, what happened is our care got segmented. So then I was not able to even have my home care workers wash my daughter's clothes. So that's when I realized that something needs to be done. And so the legislation that I'm currently working on is around that. It's around giving the care. It would be extra like 20 hours. It depends on it would uh, depend on how your evaluation would be. It would it would depend on the development of your child and then the deve- the the needs of you um the the parent. And and so yeah, it, it's a lot of work there. And as you probably can figure out that people of color with disabilities have higher rates of having their, their children taken away. The court system has very open biases against people with disabilities. And in my um, you know advoc- self-advocacy, helping other folks in Minnesota, I got to see that firsthand. And it's, it's an ugly truth to see. Wow. Our co-host today has been Nikki Villavicencio. And I just want to thank you not only for today, for joining us today, but also for all the work you've done on the issue. You really have made it uh, a much better, um, a much better publication. And we're so glad to have you as a partner on this. Well, thank you so much. It's been fun. Yeah, great. Thanks for joining the conversation. If you'd like to reproduce all or part of this podcast, please email icipub at umn.edu. Our show is co-produced at the University of Minnesota's Institute on Community Integration by Impact Managing Editor Janet Stewart and ICI Media Producer Pete McCauley. Skylar Mihailov is our editor. Graphic designers are Connie Burkhart and Sarah Kurtner. For more information on the Institute and all of our products and projects, please visit ici.umn.edu. Thank you.